dark save for light being cast from the big tv screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning hey george hey lions how's it going uh, it's it's going whipping good man I'd say it's do 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 you must <laughs> super whip it dun, 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 dun. okay um so I was really tempted to uh, tell you about this, but uh, I want to jump right into uh, the game we played because I have a thing that I think it blew my mind. So I'm hoping it's going to blow your mind, but I'm a little afraid you're going to be like, duh, obviously. So what game did we play? Uh, Super Castlevania 4. Yeah, Super Castlevania 4. So... um. I was playing this game. I was taking my notes and I had this like this feeling. And I was like, what makes this game so different from Castlevania two and three on the Nintendo? And I was like, Oh, you know what it is? This is like a return to form. Like they went back to what made the original Castlevania great. In fact, this feels a lot like the original Castlevania. It's got the same sub weapons. Wait a minute. You even play as Simon what is the timeline for Castlevania? So then, because I know, (laughs) I know like the show takes place in between two of the game generations, uh, you know, the, like Mm -hmm. the Belmont generations. And then like Alucard is in the show, but he's also in the game because he's vampire and he could live forever and ever. Right. So like he can transcend generations. And so I looked up the timeline because that in no way informs the game design or anything about the game. So that like, absolved me of research like that this doesn't count because it's not research on the game but by looking up the the timeline what i learned is canonically super castlevania 4 is actually a remake of the first game which is why it feels so much like the first game huh so it's castlevania and super castlevania 4 are like these same events yes and the thing that i thought was so delightfully ridiculous about that is Nintendo during the Super Nintendo era just tacked the word super onto everything but this is actually the Super Nintendo version of a Nintendo game like they made this game on the Nintendo they could have just called it Super Castlevania because that is what it is it's not the fourth installment it's the first installment but supercharged it is Super Castlevania which is interesting because and this is already kind of getting into one of my notes but is that like you've got, you know, there's obviously there's a whole lot of lead in that you didn't have in the original. But uh, once you enter Dracula's castle, which is where the uh, the first one started, uh, Castlevania started. I, I remember looking around and, and saying, man, they, they nailed this castle like it is a one to one from the original. I was like, the enemies are the same. You know, a lot of the jumps are the same. I was like, this is pretty pretty spot on i remember thinking that and, and writing it down to to, to discuss so uh they, i mean they did a good job it, it telegraphs pretty well if you're paying attention yeah and i mean the other thing uh for me was a lot of the music is remix of the original there's new music because there's more levels but it, there's also remix of some of the original music and i was just like oh man this is this is weird because it's i i don't think i would have noticed this as a kid right but anyway um speaking of as a kid uh this is a game uh one of my friends had um and i know that i played this game but i also know that i didn't have access to this game until very near the time i had access to symphony of the night and to me symphony of the night is castlevania when people say castlevania I don't think of the original. I don't think of all the Game Boy Advance ones that were super popular and got like crazy high review scores. I think of Symphony of the Night. So there's a lot they did in this game that is obviously setting up for Symphony of the Night. And like you could see it in some of the visuals. You could hear it in some of the music, you could, even some of the level layouts and stuff. It's like, ah, 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 right? Like if you know those those two games well enough. Um, so I'm going to try hard not to let my feelings about that game color this because 
that was a PlayStation game. This is a mirror Super Nintendo game. Um, <laughs> but, but, but when I say Castlevania, I mean Symphony of the Night. So I'm glad that I now know this is a remake of the first game because we already played the first game for the podcast. So like this is kind of a cool, unexpected coincidence we're getting here. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, when people say Castlevania, I think Castlevania because I own Castlevania, the Castlevania, and uh, and I'm right. Uh, but the <laughs> uh, so my nostalgia experience for this, I, I mean, I may have played it when I was a kid a little bit, but honestly, the thing that I think of the most is being in my early 20s and listening to the Ego Raptor review of this about a bajillion time, you know, Super Castlevania, Super Castlevania, Super. So, in the same way that you will try to not let your, you know, Cast- Symphony of the Night color your review, your opinions are bleeding too much. I will try my best not to spend this entire episode just quoting Ego Raptor. So yeah, no, I'm going to fail. It's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, I think we both had a similar problem with link to the past and Mega Man X, but we got through, we, we had our own yeah. useful, intelligent contributions to make in between like memes and references. <laughs> so we need to do the shilling thing that we do. Uh, you can find this game and the list of all the games we're going to play upcoming and stuff that's in the backlog on our website. That's also where the contact form is. So if you want to request something, go do that. Uh, probably the easiest way to shout stuff at us is on Twitter. If you're into that kind of thing, we're both on Twitter links for all this crap is in the show notes. Uh, and I also played through this entire game on Twitch and man, was there a lot of swearing at the last few bosses because (laughs) there's some issues there. So, um, I do have like actual evidence that I, I, I beat Drac- Dracula. Um, so that's all cool. You should do all that. There's also a link in the show notes to where you can rate and review us because that helps other people find the show. And if you're crazy and you want to actually give us some money uh, at all levels, our patrons get uh, access to the after show. So we record after shows sometimes and that's secret content that only patrons get. Patrons at all level get that. So as little as $1 can get more of whatever whatever this is uh whatever this is yeah i don't know it's a thing a a casting of pods i'm told uh if you go (laughs) up to the if you go up to the uh 8-bit classic or 16-bit hero level we will shout you out on the show as a special extra thank you uh so we want to thank our 8-bit classics john wielder of the dagger yarno tosser of the axe and kevin holder of the cross and our 16-bit heroes michael Splasher of Holy Water. Jacob. Watcher of the Watch. And David. Eater of Secret Roasted Dungeon Wall Chicken. <laughs> I told I you I wasn't going to do good about not getting the Ego Raptor stuff in here. I was, I was so lazy. This is why you have to do this bit, because I was just like, oh, there's five <laughs> weapons plus the whip. <laughs> so, like, he can do the five <laughs> sub-weapons plus the whip, but that's way better. <laughs> yeah because at, at the thing you said oh, are you going to do the you know five weapons plus the whip i was like i have my five weapons plus one yes <laughs> yeah like nah te- teaser S- spoilers dude um okay uh we gotta talk about the visuals as we always start um i think the visuals for super castlevania 4 are really good except there was this one thing that was bothering me and i realized it only bothers me because of that ego Raptor video. And it's, he talks so much in that video about how in the original game that a super limited color palette and they used it really expertly to make Simon pop out. And in this game, when you look at any individual screenshot, you don't really get that feeling like the enemies don't pop out. The character doesn't really pop out from the background. And yet I never felt like it was a problem. I never felt like an enemy sprung up out of nowhere. I never felt like I had no idea where Simon was on the screen because he's basically always in the dead center of the screen, you know, with like rare exceptions. So I don't know if I would have even noticed that if not for that friggin' Ego Raptor video we both watched like a thousand times. But but the graphics are like each individual sprite is like they really pushed the the Super Nintendo Mm -hmm. hardware to take the original style and 16 bit it up right like everything has way more detail things are bigger things are more colorful things have a lot more you know shading and texture and stuff and it, and it looks good but it doesn't like pop in that same way and that's 
I guess fine. Cause it, it was never like, Oh no, where is Simon? Oh no. Where did that enemy come from? Like things are arguably less contrasting, but not so much that it ever felt like a problem. I will definitely agree that uh, on two notes, one is that they did really kind of push on the individual sprites. How detailed can we make this? And as I've said before is with pixel art, man, you put a single pixel out of place and it, it just looks weird. I do know for sure that um, the direct directly down hanging whip animations, like when Simon is hanging from something, right? That looks weird. More specifically, that man has glutes for days, not glutes, uh, uh, quads. His quads are friggin' like enormous, man. Well, I, I guarantee that, you the, the glutes under his little metal skirt would also be enormous. Yes. <laughs> yes. His, his, his upper legs, um, and mid legs. Well, just, but, but then, but then he clearly skips calves, you know? I mean, yeah, it is the he, hardest he really place jumped. to build. <laughs> yeah. It's the hardest place to build masks. And I get that, you know, but Oh my God. I, I looked at that and I said, this, okay, this looks silly. But again, normally you only see that animation when he's swinging back and forth and it's, it's very dynamic. Uh, the place where it stood out to me was when you're hanging uh, in the, the part of the castle that rotates around you. So I had a chance to just stare at his quads. Oh yeah, no, we'll get to that. In a <laughs> um, not, didn't, well, no spoilers. Okay, so so that, but I, I will say that that I did feel that this game did suffer from not making the backgrounds quite contrasting enough. Um, again, never really came into any huge issues with it. Where, but there were a couple of times where I I wasn't certain that what I was about to jump on was actually in the foreground. It always was, you know, but. I, I was like a little bit more hesitant and um, the area where I said, okay, and I wasn't even going to write it down because I was like, well, it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's not a home alone two situation. Right. But what really got me is then in one level, there are in the background animated skulls that like watch where you're going. And I probably took more swings on those things than a junior league baseball player who has been out for with the flu for three months, you know? Yeah. Well, like, and, and they they played on those insecurities later because in later Castlevania games, stuff does pop out of the background like that. So there are yeah. things, there are visuals in this game that freaked me out because my association with them is from the later game. So you're right to look at that and be like, oh, well, surely it's going to pop out of the background. But no. Not yet. And you could make the argument that they're trying to do that to instill fear and uncertainty into the player. But to me, relying on the player's inability to tell foreground from background doesn't instill fear. For me, it reminds me that I'm playing a game. You know, mm, when I start doing yeah. that type of mental calculus of is this in the foreground or background? Those are things I should just be able to assess. What makes me feel un, unsure or uneasy is when all of a sudden I'm not sure if the Medusas ever stop spawning or if they're just going to keep coming forever or, you know, w whether or not this this particular thing is going to hit me or how much damage it's going to do. Like those types of things make me uh, unsure and uneasy because it's it's things that Simon would theoretically worry about. Uh, Simon should be able to tell what's five feet in front of him unless he has severe eyesight issues, in which case then I would question his dungeoneering capability. Yeah. And, and I think, and I'm, I'm going to mention this not to be a pedant, but there's no way for me to explain this without sounding like one. So please take me at my word Th this game, like a lot of uh, 2d platformers has a foreground, which is all the stuff you can interact with a background and then like a mid ground, yeah, and I feel like it's parallax it's, scrolling. Yeah, because you you never like the the true background, the the trees or the mountains off in the distance, the stars or the moon. It it's beautiful visually, and it makes the world feel like more realistic, and it gives everything more depth and perspective. But that stuff, I don't think you ever really are like, wait, can I interact with any of that? Right, and I'm not I'm not saying you're saying that. I know you're not an idiot. The problem is because you don't they know were. That. Well, <laughs> I might because... be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> don't just assume we got to do some yeah, tests. I mean, like, to... Man, I don't know, man. You, you clearly aren't aware of the scientific. Are you an idiot? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's like the end of that <laughs> like one just... Twilight Zone where like we all have pig noses. <laughs> <laughs> it just smashed. 
see you drinking, you know, the head down <laughs> meme, you know, with all the alcohol. Yeah. Um, but there are things in the mid ground that are pretty desaturated. So it's pretty obvious like, oh, they chose desaturated colors because it's a little further off. But not always because of that increased level of detail. That increased level of detail means there's a limit to how many colors they could shove on the screen at once. So if you want a foreground, a midground, and a background, and you want all that detail, like you're eventually going to start to run into some color collisions, even with the fairly powerful SNES hardware. Like there's only so many grays and browns. So <laughs> there's a lot of brickwork. You you run out of grays and browns. But um I do think it's you're right that it's not full on experience ruining the way we have seen in the fabled home alone game, but it, it does, which it does occasionally make you proceed with like unjustifiable caution. Yes. Which if anybody wants to understand that reference, we did a podcast on it. You should go check it out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I'd say that the, um, the other thing to uh, address that, you know, just to, you know, elephant in the room, uh, and this is something that Eco Raptor said. So I went into it kind of knowing, you know, that, uh, but I, I wanted to experience it for myself. And I did. You are enormous. Your reach is bananas. B A N A N A S. It's just insane, man. Like, literally, when you get the upgraded whip, uh, you, you, I, on my screen, you're, there was less screen that you were not attacking, right? So I'd say probably an eighth of the screen is you half of the screen is then your whip, you know, which le led like left like a quarter that math isn't sus, but whatever <laughs> um, three eighths of the screen that, you know, is untouched. Right. But just literally there would be, if it's on the screen, chances are it's moving towards you, which means that the minute that you see something on the screen, if you fire your whip, you're going to hit it. You know, there was never those weird crocodile skeleton heads that were terrifying in the original game held no threat whatsoever because they were always right at chest height when when you generally got in touch with them and if they started firing at you you just fired your whip and then you hit the uh the fireballs and them all at the same time so uh to our earlier point they did pull a lot of the old enemies back in because it's it's a actual a true remake but then they they changed the length of the whip which i, I am putting into visuals um because it is it's it's very visual right um but that that changes a lot of stuff right there's a lot of bad guys that um you know just don't work anymore um because because of that that change and well, they're, uh, they're yeah, like they, they're fodder now they're no longer th yes that's yeah right whereas before where you know like you had to make sure that you were timing your walk up the stairs just right so that way it like fired its fireball and then you ran up real fast and then fired your whip because your whip only went horizontally and couldn't go at every crazy angle. Right. Um, that type of stuff, you know, is just ripped out of there. Um, the, the one other quick side note that I have on that, which was uh, Teddy was watching me play this. And so he's like, Dada, what's that? And I'm like the zombie. And he's like, okay, Dada, what's that? And he would just like ask me, but then all of a sudden I realized I was like, Ooh, Ooh, no, just keep him engaged enough. Cause eventually, and then I got to stage, I think it's stage three. Yeah. Stage three. But he's like, Dada, what's that? I'm like, that is a skeleton snake dragon head from the wall. <laughs> and you feel good about yourself? <laughs> I felt so good because I had earned it, right? Because I, right at stage one, he started this and I was like, oh no, if I just wait for it. And then I saw, the reason why I mentioned it is I saw the little dragon heads and he was like, Dada, what's that? I'm like, that's a skeleton. No, nope, it's not. Nope, Hang nope, on. Not there wait yet. for it. <laughs> Yeah, if you're, if you're going to go there and you're so close to the reference, like you do have to earn it. Um, so I also want to talk about the whip being giant uh, mechanically, but the way I can circle this back a little more like firm footed into visuals is this is a decision they clearly made on purpose because there's the the whip whip, which I leather. Is that what a regular whip is made out of? Is it leather? Yeah, I think so. OK, yeah. So there's the the whip whip. Then the first upgrade gets you to the chain whip. And then the second upgrade gets you to the giant chain whip. And so the, the reason I say this like puts our feet more firmly on the ground back in visuals is someone had to like measure that, right? Like someone yeah. drew Simon cracking the regular whip and they were like, okay, it's, it's this long. It covers this much ground. It can hit enemies this far away. 
and then the 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 chain whip hits harder but it doesn't have the extra reach and then the fully upgraded whip is the giant one that you can like reach 90 percent across the screen with so i i will have more to say about that mechanically but I, I do think it's interesting that it's not just like oh well they took the sprite and they scaled it up and they didn't realize that now the whip was gigantic no they absolutely realized the whip was was bigger and then made it even bigger so yeah you you can feel it visually because the the change is significant like your reach yes. i would say it probably goes up 50 percent, maybe more it's massive and it's so much so that even in like the it's it's fairly fast little like whip crack like once it's actually out before it, you know when it comes back um you can see it on screen like how much longer your reach is to the point where you can then confidently move through the world knowing like where out in front of you your whip will crack but because it's so massive you don't really have to internalize that you'll just hit everything <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, and that's the thing is then visually and to, to try to keep this rooted in visuals, right? It's what that means is that there's very little strategizing for enemies once they come onto the screen, right? Because if once the enemy enters the screen, the amount of time that passes between, think about it in terms of like error bars, or at least that's the way I'm thinking about it right now, which is that the enemy comes onto the screen, right? That starts when you can start to basically interact with it, right? And so the amount of time that passes between when it comes onto the screen and when you can reasonably dispatch it, right, is very, very short because your range is so long, right? And then the amount of time that then passes between when you can dispatch it, right, and when it will hit you is probably three times longer, you know? So that's that's substantial. And it, and, and it therefore makes the game way easier, especially when you can, and this is getting more into mechanics, but when you can angle your whip, right, the way that you can, that means that there's even less strategizing to make sure that it is in line with you, you know? So basically, the minute that something appears onto the screen, the minute that you get the visual cue of, hey, there's an enemy, I've got to do something about that, uh, like half a second passes, and then you've got basically all the time in the world to kind of figure that out, you know? Yeah, they, they really... Changing literally just the length of the whip probably makes it a little bit more realistic in length because I mean a whip is huge like it's a gigantic weapon and Simon is not small so you know to have the whip barely reach out in front of him is like well it's not a close range weapon a whip is meant for like huge distances so they they almost should have waited to make the whip length more realistic until they had like 16 by 9 screens and then they could have said like, oh, well, now because now there's, you know, an enemy comes onto the screen and like they might do something crazy before they're close enough for you to hit them. But yeah, um, I, I want to make sure I throw this out there just uh, so I don't forget um, my way of agreeing with your comment on his mighty thighs is uh, to share with you that I was five, maybe 10 minutes into my my first stream of this game before. Uh, someone who was watching posted in chat. What is with his thighs? <laughs> just like, yeah, he's, you know, he's got mighty thighs and he knows it, which is why he wears like a little, you know, mini skirt. Cause he's like, yeah, I work hard for these legs. I have to eat yeah, a man. ridiculously strict diet. Please appreciate my quads. But here's the thing. Uh, kidding aside, sort of kidding aside, sort of um, in the original Castlevania, uh, Simon kind of power walks, kind of marches, you know, when he steps. Um, and he also walks like that in this game. But because you can see that the curve of his thigh muscles and you can see his calves bulging and his, his kneecaps out there with every confident, weirdly bent leg stride, like it kind of makes him look crazy. Luckily, there's yeah. usually there's usually more stuff going on so that you're not just walking in a straight uninterrupted line for an extended period. But there are actually a couple times in the game where you do have to do that exact thing. And he just he walks with the the kind of confidence of someone who is not confident and is hoping no one notices. He's just like, yeah, I'm Simon. I'm coming through. Just march, 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 march. It just it looks a little silly if you see him take too many steps without like stopping to whip or jumping or 
you know, ducking to avoid enemy fire. Like if he's just walking, I really hope he doesn't walk around town like that. Cause otherwise people would just, or like in his house, like imagine if he had a two story house and he was walking around on the second floor like that, like you'd be like, Oh God. Hey mom, is Simon what? home? I don't know. Do you hear an elephant marching around upstairs? <laughs> yeah, he's here. Yeah, well, either an elef- uh, either Simon or a five-year-old, because I've noticed that all five-year-olds <laughs> walk around like they're elephants. Also true. But uh, maybe so that's it. He's remind just, me that he's just a giant five-year-old. So actually, that I, I want to wait until we get into mechanics to make this point. But but please remind me about the whip size and 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 and, and the march and how that kind of re- re- reframes some stuff. Um, I've got a couple of other uh, throwaway things for visuals. Do you have any any other odd, heavy hit and stuff? Oh, well, we have to talk about uh, the the term for it is mode seven, the the programmatic oh, way yeah, they yeah. animate stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, that aged really bad, like really, really bad, bad, in my opinion. And not every game we've played that has mode seven. I felt it was utter garbage. Like you can always see it. Like, you know it when you see it. Um, they also seem to be a little timid with it because there's two places in the game. Th- sorry, three that I could think of that really lean into it, but it they're fairly short. So there's the part you mentioned where you're hanging and you just have to stare at the screen while it rotates which, by the way, side story, um, I didn't understand they wanted me to wait, so I kept trying to make an impossible jump that killed me every yep, single time. Me too. Yeah, okay, yep, good. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Lost that, a lot of lives doing that. Yeah, I have to annoying. restart the level. Very <laughs> upset about it. <laughs> um, good. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then in um, another stage, I think it's actually a later part of that same stage. The inti- it, 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 it is. It is stage four. Yeah, the entire they, background... Yeah, it, is rotating as if you're inside of a cylinder. Like if you were walking down the center of a rotating cylinder, um, yep. That looked like utter garbage. Like that honest to God made me nauseous and it made, and it made Megan nauseous. So here's the thing, my dude. Um, I don't normally get motion sick, but playing through that level, I was like, Oh, this is what that must feel like. Like I am so I'm, I, like, I don't feel nauseous, but I feel uncomfortable, like trying to reconcile what my body is feeling with what my eyes are seeing is not good, but that segment is not very hard. So you're unlikely to have to repeat it and it's not very long, but it, it's just, ugh. um, and then the one other time that I could think of where they, they lean into it pretty hard is with the swinging chandeliers toward the end. Um, the, those chandeliers are static assets that are then, you know, being programmatically animated, and you can really see it because those pixels jump around all crazy in a way nothing else does. Um, but again, that segment's like, it's pretty short. It's not like it's, you kind of have to pay attention to what you're doing. You can't really just sit there and, and take it all in. So you don't obsess over it too much, but yeah, that the mode seven stuff in this game aged particularly poorly. I will say specifically with the chandeliers, and this is a story that I may have told on this podcast before, but they're evergreen episodes. So, you know, every day there's someone born who's never seen the Simpsons. So you you go for it. Yep. Yep. And I know you've said that before. So that feels like makes me feel bit more okay with that retelling my thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, with that one in particular, I noticed as I was jumping that, your momentum doesn't carry, right? So if the if the chandelier is swinging forward and then you jump forward, you jump par- you know, parallel with the chandelier, right? And I, that just made me think of uh, I had a similar thing where at one point in a video game I was on a on a uh, like a a lift carrying me across an endlessly plummeting chasm, and uh, uh, I jumped, and the lift continued to move forward, and I plummeted to my death. And I said, oh. So like Newtonian physics don't really hold here. And Megan said, what? And I said, well, because the momentum isn't carrying with me when I jump, right? I, I jumped, I lost all my momentum and fell to the bottom. And Megan said, no, no, that's right. And I said, no, no, it's, it's, it's not like it, you should, the momentum should carry. And she said, no, no, no. If you, if you like stand up, then it keeps, it would keep going and you would stop. And I said, honey, if that were true, <laughs> 
planes wouldn't work because the minute somebody went up to go to the bathroom, they would, the plane would continue to move at 500 miles an hour and they would be pink misted against the back of the jet <laughs> because they would just stop moving and the back of the airplane would hit them at 500 miles an hour. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that doesn't sound right. So I say all of that to say that the Mode 7 screwed me up because it doesn't carry momentum. <laughs> I do. I do. I, I like <laughs> that not resulting in her being like oh absolutely it's like yeah i guess and it's like you've been on a plane <laughs> <laughs> what's is this one of those things that you know it's 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 a little difficult to internalize because it's like oh well if i'm tossing a ball to myself then it's just going up and down it's like yes but if you're on a train and the observer is on the countryside beside it you are throwing it in an arcing motion to yourself it's just again something that if you if you had any stem courses you are likely to have seen before but if you haven't or or it's been a while you know you're like that that doesn't sound right right but yeah anyways um, i always get a kick out of, <laughs> out of that particular story yeah no i, I mean i also personally i i will re-listen to that story just for the phrase pink misted because <laughs> you you want to talk about uh uh concept that belongs in the visuals section of the podcast like that paints yes. a picture um i i have <laughs> poof i have uh just this one <laughs> other thing um i did want to mention and then uh, I, know, I know you said you had a couple other notes just uh the thing that this game does a lot better than the original castlevania is because they have more space and more detail and more like storage for levels is just that much more variety like the original castlevania already had like rich different interesting levels they had different enemies like not every level but there there was some variety there um unique bosses at the end of each stage right so there there's a lot of variety in the original castlevania and when they made super castlevania 4 they supercharged that right like there's more levels but they're not samey there there's more variety there is some enemy reuse, but there are, I think there's at least some unique enemies in every single level. I don't think they ever just copy paste holes, right? Like bats and the stupid little green crawly things are all over the place. But like there's a lot skeletons. Yeah, the stupid bone throwing skeletons. But like there's there's a lot Which, of unique enemies that are are special to different levels in different parts of the game. Um, and there's more bosses and all the bosses stay unique. Right. We were just talking about this with. Uh, streets of rage 2 where like bosses become regular enemies and castlevania never does that because the bosses aren't big powerful monsters they're like they're singular individuals right they are unique right frankenstein's monster isn't one of many frankenstein's monsters right medusa is a gorgon but in this universe she's the gorgon she's the medusa right right? so like I, i really enjoy that it it takes something that doesn't really have a super thick narrative and it makes you the player kind of ask more questions. Cause like you see the Medusa or the, you know, Frankenstein's monster or even like a giant bat or the big skull or whatever. And you're just like, where did you come from? Like, what is your deal? Right. And so they, they can spend a lot of time making that boss like cool looking and animated in an interesting way and interact with the, the level in an interesting way or the little battle arena in an interesting way, because they only have to do it once so they can build like a little tailored experience. And that's, that that's something I'm really glad they didn't just say like, Oh, well, we already have, you know, the five original bosses or whatever. They were like, now we need like 15 bosses. So actually uh, w- one of your things was just one of mine. That was tons of enemy variation. Uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, cosine a hundred percent. And the other, only other thing I had really had for visuals was um, once in a blue moon, they do put just a ton of stuff on screen and uh, that that tends to to uh, clutter things up Gradius style, right? It it's very very rare that it happens, but um, definitely like when you're fighting the mud monsters, or if with your you know giganto mega whip, you're able to whip apart like three skeletons at a time, and they all explode into their mini explodey things. Um, you know, sometimes that that takes up a little bit of a uh, processor real estate, but. Um, but again, you know, nothing, nothing too severe. Yeah. And it's, that is one of those things that I, I almost wonder if that's like a reverse nostalgia goggles situation that like, here, I'm going to, I'm going to think, think in real time out loud here. So 
a lot of games that we consider classic games, part of what made them enduring is that they were well programmed, right? So it's not that there's no classic games that don't have slowdown that people still love, but a lot of the games you remember most fondly is part of it is because they played really well, you know, modern games, especially if you play on uh PC or I mean, modern consoles are all PC like hardware. So you've got loading screens, you know, things can get bogged down, textures clip in and out of reality and things fade in and out of existence because they're just so many orders of magnitude more complicated. I almost wonder if you put like a young kid, like, you know, a, a Minecraft age kid in front of a Super Nintendo game that had slowdown, like, would they even notice or would they just think like, <laughs> well, this is how computers work. Like sometimes they get bogged down and then old people like us would be like, no, this is a console game. It should, <laughs> everything it should, should be instantaneous, perfect frame lock. Like, yeah, yeah I don't know. <laughs> and for me, I think that there is some, but again, like I said, it, it's, 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 neither here nor there, just just kind of an observation. Uh, for me, it kind of does fall into like a good nostalgia goggles thing because it, it, it now if it's constant, it's irritating. But when you see it once in a while, it it's kind of like the the fun side of Bethesda games breaking, you know, where it's it's just something that you kind of expect sometimes. And most of the time it's innocuous and sometimes it's hilarious, you know, and, and you just kind of move on with life. I think it kind of hits that that same type of area for me where all of a sudden, you know, somebody is going to uh, beat you to death unless you take a quest for them. And you're like, well, I don't think this is how the code was supposed to run, but this is now a thing I have to deal with. So, well, and, and you just nailed it, right, is I can't think of any time where the slowdown happened that it made me unable to play the game. It did temporarily affect my enjoyment of the game, but it never I, I can't think of literally even a single time where I was like, I died because of the slowdown. And that's, that ain't, that ain't nothing, right? <laughs> to, right? to be able to say like, yeah, it's annoying, but it, it literally will never even cost you a life. Like, oh, well, okay. Or even a hit, to be honest, yeah. you know? So, yep. Agreed. Audio? God, dude, the music is so good. It's so good. good. It's good. And it's, it's good. It's not just the remix tracks, right? Because they, they reused a lot of the same music. Um, it's all the new tracks. It's also the remix tracks because they were good and they improved upon them with the more powerful hardware. Like there's, I don't know why the composer, uh, for ca the Castlevania series. Cause it, it was the same composer for like a lot of the games. Um, I don't know why they decided this feels like kind of a rock music, but also pipe organs, but also sometimes uh, like strings. Like, I, I don't know why. Like, I don't know what it is about Castlevania that made this person think we're going to just go over like every genre and we're going to do it all and we're going to do it all really well, right? Like, the, I think the only thing that's not represented is like, like folksy, like Western bluegrassy, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like steel guitar sort of music, but just like 50 different genres and all done really well. And somehow the crazy thing is that they all feel coherent. Like if you yeah. queue up the soundtrack on uh, YouTube, cause you know, you can't get anywhere officially. So you got to just listen to like a, a YouTube video with the soundtrack. Um, the songs are all super different. And yet somehow you never catch yourself thinking like, but why that one? Right? Like the weird yeah, like ambient scary tracks, the power rock, super inspiring tracks, like everything fits somehow and it's just it's great the series has amazing music and this installment is no different agreed 100 percent. cosine on all that uh sound effects so i <laughs> <laughs> i i like that like sound effects has you're you're starting to carve out a niche and i i enjoy it <laughs> well i mean i mean honestly i don't I 100% I, I agree with everything you said. If I were to say anything else, it would just be me rehashing all of your uh, uh, comments. But yeah, no, sound effects. So um, I, I was honestly not very impressed with uh, some of the sound effects in this game. Um, more specifically, the both the visual and the um, sound effect for hitting an enemy is uh, it's not that great. You know, it's just kind of like a, 
like a dink dink like it's just it i and i can't really put so like for example when you hit the uh the metal um uh not metal the the uh, bone skeleton uh Jeez. Oh, the the stationary ones that like spit fire. Yeah, yeah, it's spit fire. Yeah, they're, they're like it's turrets. Just... They operate like yeah, little turrets. turrets. Yeah, when you hit them, like it kind of makes a dink dink noise, right? And and that's that's fine. But the original Castlevania made like this. It 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 doubled up on the noise somehow, and it just made it really satisfying to hit those things. In this one, I just didn't feel as satisfied hitting stuff, or even necessarily being aware that I was dealing damage you know there were definitely a couple of times exact like when i was hitting the skeleton snake dragon heads from the wall right where i was i was like is this am i doing it am i hitting the thing and and i was because you know your whip is huge and you can't not hit stuff but um yeah the, i don't i don't really think that the the sound effects were as satisfying as they were even in the nes version of it you know um this is my two cents but what, what yeah. are your thoughts no i'm 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 unfortunately in like complete agreement with you uh, because <laughs> it, it, I did notice that the sound was underwhelming. What I had failed to notice on my own was that they had already gotten this right previously. And that's what makes it a bummer <laughs> is yeah. they already had a really satisfying, like it it's, it's like a hit spark noise. It's, it's yeah, it like, like a plink plink. Yeah. Yeah. I, I almost imagine like if you, um, if you took like a, a, a rock and you like scraped it on another rock like that, like a flint mm-hmm. kind of motion, um, or if you like dropped a piece of metal like against stone, um, because most of the time you have the metal whip. I wonder, I don't think the the leather whip has a different noise, but it, maybe it does, but it, it doesn't matter. Like the, it's just not, it's not satisfying and it's not it like I nothing it. Like it's yeah. If if you didn't have the visual to tell them to like to tell the player that you were hitting an enemy, then it might be a little more disappointing. But it's like, well, I mean, I know I'm hitting them because, as you said, like I can't miss. Like swinging my whip <laughs> means hitting a target. Um, but, but yeah, it's just it's just kind of like meh. And again, you know, this is not. <laughs> it's kind of like the. Uh, is it is it fair to compare Star Wars three to Citizen Kane? Nope, but I'm <laughs> going to anyway. It's like, is it fair to compare Super Castlevania to Castlevania? Or really, you know, yeah, kind of, because it is a, a a sequel to it. But same point in time, Castlevania is a classic. But literally, think about the sound effects that it would make when you would hit enemies in Castlevania, when you hit enemies in Mega Man, when you hit enemies in Zelda. Right? That is satisfying man it makes a good satisfying hit sound right this just wasn't that and again the only reason why i feel okay bagging on it a little bit is because it is a direct sequel to the original like you said they 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 got it right and then they scaled up all the visuals and made all the enemies look super cool and all this sort of stuff and it's like and then how did you love the audio on that like they must have just had to have started from scratch and said good enough and shipped it you know but uh, it, it almost weird. feels like this is the one thing they forgot to supercharge. Like <laughs> maybe this is the original Castlevania sound effect, but because everything else is louder, the visuals are louder. The music is louder. Like it's being drowned out. So like in, in the simpler meal of the original Castlevania, this little bit of spice stood out because it was like, it was thoughtfully placed here it's like drowned out by all of the other powerful flavors. Right? That's almost what it feels like is they, they I'm sure they didn't, but it almost feels like they took that sound wholesale and they were just like, yeah, it's fine. Just keep, keep using it the way it is. And it's like, no, not if, if you turn up the volume on all the other faders that you can't leave that one down at the same level. Now it's going to sound out of sorts. And, and honestly, this is kind of true for most of the sound effects. Like most of the sound effects are just not, they're not very loud. They're not very punchy. They're not very threatening or inspiring. Like they're just, they're there and they are useful, but they're not, they're not on nearly the level that the music is. And they're not on, they're not on the level that the, the visual, like they're not amped up the way the visuals were amped up when they got to the super Nintendo. It's, 
it is weirdly out of place how just kind of like gray they feel compared yeah. to the like vibrancy of everything else. Well, and, and I think that here's, here's my hypothesis and I'll stop beating this horse, but this is the one other note that I had for audio, which is that I think that when they ported, when they brought everything, when they built everything in the, in the SNES, I think that they used just like whatever Konami's stock sound soundboard was, you know? And the reason why is because I played an un conscionable amount of Gradius 3 when I was a kid, right? I mean, I just played that game into the ground. Uh, we did a whole episode on it, if you'd like to hear it. <laughs> Apparently, that's what I'm going to do Do this episode, is just shill other episodes. <laughs> um, so because of that, I very, very much so know a very specific explodey sound that Konami games make. And this game, when you destroy the uh, the turrets, right, the dragon turrets, it makes that sound. It that it is that Konami stock soundboard sound. So what make what my guess would be is that they just populated everything from the stock soundboard, and then for whatever reason, out of time, didn't care, didn't think it was important, whatever, um, just stuck with it. You know, so all of these are just none of the sounds are custom. They're all just what they already had files for. You, you might be right, and I think that's one of those things that. I can almost imagine an audio engineer not realizing, oh, this thing doesn't stand alone. It's part of a body of work of things Konami produces, right? It's like uh, mm -hmm. it, people make this joke about like Italian food or Mexican food or, or any food that it's like any culture's food where you can be like, oh, it's the same four ingredients, but in like slightly different arrangements, right? Mm -hmm. Like pizza and and can only, like you just, you just yeah you just take it and fold it in half and night there you go right like it's <laughs> it it it's not harmful in isolation like the sound effects aren't inspiring but they're not bad but when you can say oh that's the gradius sound they reused and oh that's like this other like metal noise that they reused and oh that's this magic sound effect that they reused and oh that's a stone crumbling sound effect they reused like even if that's not literally happening, if you, the player, are just starting to feel that way, it just, one, it reminds you you're playing a game because now you're thinking about the company, Konami. And two, <laughs> it, it just kind of brings down the experience a little when you're like, oh, man, look at the graphics. Oh, man, listen to the music. Oh, man, these sound effects. <laughs> Agreed. But again, you know, the music is spectacular and the, the sound effects being lackluster, I would not say really took me out of the game. It was just kind of like a, oh, that was... That was a little disappointing, but not bad overall. Yeah. Um, the one other thing I wanted to say about the, the soundtrack, um, just because we have made the uh, fish with legs uh, analogy a lot of times because it's really useful. It's an, I, I yeah. think it's an excellent shorthand. Um, yes. No, I, I, I would say that, that definitely that metaphor is not a fish with legs. It is a full on, <laughs> you know, primate, right? Like that is a fully formed analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel that way, like the music in this game is a, a, a stopover worth stopping over on the journey to the absolute like masterpiece that is the Symphony of the Night soundtrack, right? Because this guy, this guy right here, <laughs> if you, if you listen to the original Castlevania soundtrack, you're like, oh man, this music is really good. And then if you jump forward to Symphony of the Night, you're like, oh, my God, there's this is huge. Like this is you could score cinema and operas with this. This is phenomenal. It's all over the place, like rock operas, like it's all over the place. It's fantastic. And because I have those two bookends as like what I think of as Castlevania is the original one. And more importantly, Symphony of the Night, I was afraid a little bit like I was like, oh, am I going to be is this going to be? the fish with legs where the soundtrack will be, you know, better than Castlevania, but it won't be symphony of the night. Good, but no dude, like this is a road stop worth making soundtrack wise on your way between Castlevania and symphony of the night. Like it is, it stands on its own merits. It's not just good because the original soundtrack was good. It's not just good. Cause you can hear some of the little motifs that they're eventually going to reuse later in symphony of the night. Like it's good on its own merits. And I was like, yay, 
it's not a fish with legs. Like it's an honest to God <laughs> reptile. Like this is now a creature that came from the sea, but lives on land. It does. It does its own thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is the David pumpkins of, uh, of music. Uh, gameplay and mechanics. Wait, yeah, no yeah, controls and mechanics. Hey, you got there. Uh, let's let's <laughs> yeah. talk about the whip. There's nothing. <laughs> the whip is everything. Uh, the, I literally, I literally have this note, um, in my, my notes here, whip is everything. Whip is life. Whip solves all problems. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, the only time when you like, I will say that I used sub weapons from time to time, but I never had to, it was never the ax versus the stage one boss of Castlevania, right? Like, Remember the bat in Castlevania, you know? If you didn't have the axe, you were basically screwed, you know? I mean, you could beat him, but man, you had to be good at the game. Whereas this one, I I, I never really used the the sub weapons because I had to. Um the thing that I wanted to make sure that I touched on, right? So the whip is everything, right? The whip basically means as I said is that when you walk onto the screen, you can kind of hit most things. So that would be like me walking into a room and then seeing, being able to survey all of the enemies and then smiting them, right? Just like reaching out and just like hitting them. And many of them are one hit kills with this giant monster whip, right? So you're fighting monsters though, right? So that that makes it like, you know, okay that you're just kind of walking in wholesale slaughtering them, right? Um. Now, I'm not sure like who decided that they were monsters, but all of a sudden I realized that that this could very easily be Undertale, right? <laughs> I mean... Be- because you are so much more powerful than the monsters, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's like the, the, the whole thing in Undertale, right? Was it's like, oh, well, they're monsters, but a single human could kill like thousands of monsters. You're, it doesn't matter, you know? And, you know, so this is way closer to instead of Dark Souls, where you're stuck in a room full of demons, <laughs> like this is definitely Doom, where demons are stuck in a room with you, you know? And then it just hit me where I was like, no, wait, the story has been told and it's Undertale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the narrative would say otherwise, but you're right that it's like, well, from their perspective, though, but I... <laughs> Okay. Anyway, the, the thing I want to say about the whip, uh, <laughs> now, now that we're playing uh, Super Undertale Four on the Super Nintendo, um, the thing I want to say about the whip uh, that I, I didn't say before because we were we were leaning pretty hard into how the whip behaves mechanically is uh, the reason that I was able to so easily internalize the length of the fully powered up whip is because when you die. Within the first four candles, you will get both whip upgrades. Yes. So you get them immediately. You I, never not have the big whip. Yes. And that's the thing that blew my mind once I realized it, I, because there's some levels that I struggled with or some of the later bosses that just absolutely ate my lunch. But I was like, there's one, literally one. I can tell you exactly when it happened. There was one time in the entire game where I didn't have the upgraded whip like immediately. Uh, so the, the fly demon that he's like, he's blue. And then halfway through, he turns red. Um, who's also in the Castlevania show and in symphony of the night. Um, when you're, if you die fighting him, you reclimb a flight of stairs and then you jump over a platform and then you're back in the, the boss room. And I don't know why, I don't know if I was doing it wrong, but for some reason between the stairs and him, I only got one whip upgrade. And the thing is, the weaker whip is also shorter. So he flies around all crazy all over the place. And so having the shorter whip is a massive handicap, a massive (laughs) handicap that you never, ever, as far as I can tell, have to deal with ever in the entire rest of the game. There's no and I died other places. Believe me, there's nowhere else in the entire game where I was like, oh, no, I died. I'm screwed now because I'm going to have the crappy whip because within like I said, two to four candles, you immediately have the better whip again. And so that's what really blew my mind about the choice to make the whip, not just deal more damage, but have the insane reach because you have this insane reach 
all the time. That is effectively your default state. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I would definitely say that it was more novel for me to not have the upgraded web, you know, um, for sure. I think also, too, you don't get it when you're going into the uh, tourney room, you know, the mode seven room, because you literally just spawn and go directly in there. Because I remember hanging with the leather whip a number of times. But also, when you're doing that, you're you're fighting the Medusa. Medusopodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, it it doesn't really come into play that much. Um, oh sh! I make that joke all the time. I think that might actually be true because if Apodes is Greek and Medusas are Greek, it, it it is. But and so not to take this away from you, but the challenge I would say is there's only one Medusa. Oh, so it'd be they're Gorgons. Yeah, damn Gorgons. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Medusa's a proper noun. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. Even though I, so I mean, I had to use it incorrectly, but I was doing it to test. You. Yeah. No, th- this this is fair because if I'm ever going to actually earn that victory, where I make that joke and it's actually with a Greek word, <laughs> I want it to be legitimate. <laughs> like if I'm going to yeah. get that gold medal, I don't want it to be because everybody else dropped out of the race. Yeah, you, you don't want the asterisks, right? Um. So, uh, and and I will say that. Okay, so not only is your whip monstrous, uh, and you can angle it straight up. And at 45 degrees, you can also just kind of freeform that stuff and <laughs> change its trajectory mid swing. Yeah. So I just, I mean, again, you know, you the, the there is nothing that you can't hit with your whip. All of that being said, I will say that the re-angling of the whip works very well as far as I mean, like it's it's broken in the sense that it makes you into a golden invincible god, right? I mean, it makes it, it you can hit everything, right? But I will say that there were a couple of times when I like swat, swatted out with my whip and then realized mid swing that I was like, no, wait, I really wanted to swing up. So then I angled, you know, I rolled up and then he did kind of whip it up a little bit and would wing the thing I was trying to wing. So I believe it's working the way the designers intended, but just, I mean, you, you, the SAT question for this is, you know, Mario is to his jump arc as Simon from Castlevania four is to his whip control, right? You know, like you have infinite control over the direction of your whip to the point where physics is like, no, wait, what? But, uh, that's, that's that. That's what I have to say about the, the whip trajectory. Well, and so two, two other things that I had struggled with the choices the game designers made is so the flay i'm gonna call it flailing the flailing motion you can do with the whip where it just goes like <laughs> like yeah. a wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man um there are actually a couple times because of the way enemies are placed and because of the way platforms are placed where i was like that this is actually how they want me to solve this problem wiggling the whip around like an idiot because that seems to be the correct way to deal with this problem and that just feels weird because it looks so silly it's so unserious and kind of like cartoony to just be like <laughs> yeah so no, it, it it's weird looking for sure yeah that that's weird that they ever like force you to do that and and i swear there were a few times where they did the thing that actually like legit irritated me is, you know, picture a super Nintendo controller, not counting start and select because finally we live in an era where those are not buttons used for gameplay. You have (laughs) four four face buttons and two shoulder buttons. And then you can also do combinations of like up plus a maybe does something different than just a right. But this game, it, 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 the mechanically they're awash with buttons, right? Like there's way more, buttons on the controller than things you can do so in the original castlevania it's i think up up b up an attack to use your sub weapon yep in this they just mapped it straight to r i don't know why yep but they just they mapped it straight to r and l l's over there it's cool shoulder button right it's like ah i want to do cool shoulder button things and to me in a game like this l is lock as in, let me stand still holding the L button and then whip in whatever direction I point in, but don't make me walk in that direction. And this was actually the one and only place where it felt like the diagonal whipping 
was slightly less powerful than it might have been because if you could stand still and whip diagonally there's a couple of times where that would essentially just let you avoid combat encounters because you could stand on the stairs and whip diagonally because you actually have to press in the direction that you're whipping which makes you walk until you press the whip button sometimes you will take a couple of steps in that direction which may put you into the line of fire and so I mean, it's not game breaking. You're already you're super powerful, right? Like you're very seldom at risk from enemies. Platforming kills you all the time. You're very seldom at risk from enemies. But I was like, you have all these extra buttons, Konami. Like use one of them to lock me in place. And part of the reason this is this feels like the right choice to me is because in uh, Super Metroid, you can lock yourself in place so that you can fire around, right? And in uh, Cuphead, which I've been playing recently, you can lock yourself in place because you can fire in eight directions. So it was just like, th- this is a thing that by this time, they were maybe wasn't well under their belt. Cause they, oh, I didn't say at the top of the show, this game came out in 1991. So by 1991, they knew that uh, pressing on the D pad was for movement. And so, like, it, I don't know, it, it just irritated me. I was just like, come on, like, let me, let me lock Simon in place. Let him use those mighty thighs to stand his ground and whip without having to like step into it. Yeah. I think maybe it's the only way that he can, he can whip at that angle is to like get a good, like, you know, angled start and then whip across his body to get up at that <laughs> 45 it. degrees. He's, he's got to take one powerful step, one mighty step. And you see his, his muscles cord as he presses down into the granite and it shatters underneath his feet. Um, so all that being said, uh, I have two other kind of uh, heavier notes. Um, one of them is, uh, you don't, so you get, you get stuff, you get, um, parts, you get sub weapons, you get a a bajillion T axe upgrades. Uh, that, that's it though. Um, and, which means that you don't get experience or realistically any reward outside of score for killing bad guys, right? That aesthetic is, or or mechanic is to me always reminiscent of, and I think rightfully so here, uh, reminiscent of horror gameplay, right? As opposed to uh, empowerment gameplay, because it, this, the minute that you start giving people power ups for killing bad guys, they are now going to go seek out and exterminate every bad guy right um which is not what you do in a horror game in a horror game your your goal is to survive and accomplish your goal whatever that goal is right so if you if there is an area that you don't have to go to you don't go there right like i mean i remember in the last of us at one point you know because you do scrounge and you do forage but there was there was like three clickers off in a direction and i was like i can't think of any reason for me to go down there so i'm not going to because i know that there's danger and a resource demand in order for me to get down there and i don't get anything from killing clickers so why in the hell would i ever do it you know so thumbs up i think that that's good i am glad that the bad guys don't drop any power-ups they don't drop health upgrades they don't they don't do any of that you get all that from candles and that's it um the only other thing that I'll touch on is, you know, because I feel like I would be remiss in my uh, duties if I didn't, is cycle time. You, you haven't talked about cycle time on the last couple of games at all, did you? No, man. That's what I'm saying. I, I've just been crazy. I've, I've not been doing my job. Yeah. Well, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. That and and I had good notes for audio. This is this is weird, you know, because I'd say it was old George coming back, but then I'd have garbage notes for audio. Um. But anyways, uh, this is the new George uh, cycle time. So overall, I thought the cycle time was pretty good. Uh, you know, you respawn at kind of the stage that you're at unless you lose all of your lives and you go back to the beginning of the level, which is fine. Except that the it's 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 weird. And the reason why I wanted to discuss it with this game is that you I think the cycle time is fine and appropriate because of the failure spectrum when you're using your whip. Right. The failure spectrum when you're using your whip is basically enormous because, like I said, you have so much time to react to anything coming onto the screen and, by extension, have so much life, right, that you can you, you have to screw up pretty badly and a lot before all of a sudden it's like, okay, champ, why don't you try this stage again? All right, you're still screwing up. Try the whole level again, right? except when they throw platform challenges at you because now all of a sudden this failure spectrum is binary. You made that jump or you did not, right? 
So the impact that having a difficulty spike in platforming completely rips apart the uh, the difficulty curve of the game, right? Because if they throw a platforming section in, it is a hard wall. Because if it strips you of all of your lives going into it, like those little green spinny dealies, you know, that like drop you into pits, I probably burned four lives on those. And then all of a sudden I was restarting the whole level, which to your point, wasn't helping me get any better at all of the stuff I was screwing up because that was all platforming. I had mastered that portion of the level. So I felt that any time when they were making it a platforming challenge, it caused an inadvertent difficulty spike because of the failure spectrum set up by the whip and your life in the rest of the game, which I actually thought was pretty fascinating. Yeah, I I don't... I, I agree with you that they are, like, discordant, that moving through Dracula's castle is arguably the far bigger threat. Like just yes. getting from point A to point B is the thing that is more likely to make Simon fail than <laughs> all of the eldric horrors that are floating around. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't think of any levels where I felt like I am miles and miles from the thing that killed me. And it's going to be ages before I can practice it again. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I gotta, you know, I gotta walk over there. But it was more like, like, God damn it, this is harder than it should be. Not, God damn it, this is wasting tons of my time. Agreed. No, I, I agree completely. I don't think that the cycle time was, you know, a, at any point, even to the point where I was like, you know what, I got other stuff to do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely wasn't that, but I thought, it, like I said, I found it fascinating because the times when I did feel that that the cycle time was more punishing wasn't because the cycle time changed it was because the failure spectrum changed which is something that i don't think i've had an example quite as distilled an example to point to like this right where where you can have a longer cycle time if you have a broader failure spectrum you know where you can because then it feels more deserved right you're like no i screwed that up quite a bit like i you know i started replaying the last of us and uh and literally, I got kicked back five minutes of gameplay, but it was because it was in a combat section. And I mean, I pretty viciously screwed up several things in succession. And I was like, no, I deserve that. You know, let me go back and try again. But because uh, most of it is like, no, I got hit by the bat and then I got hit by this other thing. And I wasn't paying attention and got hit by the bat again. Like, you know, that's all fine. But then all of a sudden it's like, no, I got stripped of four out of my five lives because I first didn't understand how the platforms worked. and then couldn't quite figure it out but by the time i figured it out i was good but i did burn four lives trying to figure it out and it's stage four dash three not four dash one you know well if the combat was harder then there would be times where you get just overrun by enemies or just beaten to death before you can do anything and so even if you have a lot of health there would be these instances where you're like yeah i have a lot of health but there's this one spot where like a bunch of red skeletons are going to gang up on me all at once. And and they will just drain my health almost as fast as falling in a pit, but that never happens. I like right. you're, you're virtually never except some of the bosses, which I'll get to in a second. You're virtually never in a situation where the monsters are really the main threat where you're going to get beaten to death. And I didn't even regularly feel like I'm getting worn down to death. Like, and and that I'm not saying that it's because it never happened. I'm saying I never felt disempowered or or terrorized by the monsters. I felt terrorized by pits. So like <laughs> the, the thing that made me afraid, oh, I'm going to I'm going to get tossed back was virtually never like, oh, man, like I, I just barely made it through the super tough combat section and now I'm super hurt. Like there are a couple instances of that, but by and large, enemies are just there to make sure you know how the whip works and and it's the and it's the platforms that are the real threat which is yeah i agree with you like it is really interesting to just be like oh the the cycle time is fine it's the thing that triggers the cycle time is not you being worn down it's instantly being thrown back in time yeah. oh my god yeah it, it's it's really closer to you know celeste right or like mario with just the platforms or all of a sudden it's not the bad guys that are going to get you generally it's just falling to your death and then i died or died you could die (laughs) so i need to talk about the bosses 
uh, because this is actually maybe my largest single complaint about this game. Um, how, did you, were you able to finish by any chance? No, nah, no, nah, I got to stage six. Okay. So there's like 10 or 11 stages. And then there's like the, the final stage, like stage B is literally just four bosses in a row. It's, it's this one hard boss. It's this other hard boss. It's death. And then Dracula. So, and, and there's, continues in between those so like you can oh this game has a password system you could get a password right before dracula and right before death and right before the demon thing that changes color so like the boss rush is hard but if you die you start right at the beginning of that boss there's no stage like you're just right into the boss fight and there's actual passwords that will load you into any of those places which i think is just awesome I don't know how granular the passwords are in between the individual stages because I never stopped in the middle of a stage. But my point is this, the whip solves all problems right up until the end of the game. I am not exaggerating when I say I think nine out of the 10 stage bosses I beat by literally standing still and just wailing on them. No jumping, Mm -hmm. no sub weapon, It's just, I could deal them damage faster than they could deal me damage. And I came really close to death on a couple of them, but I literally stood perfectly still and just whip, 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 done. And, you know, the first couple times I was like, well, okay. And then boss after boss after boss, that tactic worked without fail and I was like, oh, this is kind of disappointing because like the original Castlevania bosses were hard. Like you really yeah, had to like duck and weave and bob and move and and like jump over stuff and duck under some projectiles and be like, oh, I'm going to use this as protection. And maybe if I throw my sub weapon from here and yeah, like a lot of interesting gameplay was tucked into those bosses. And so I was legit disappointed that these bosses were so damn uninspired. Fun side story. Um, When I was fighting uh, Medusa, I swung my whip and she hit me with like her stone gaze, which freezes you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it freezes you instantly in place. So it froze me with the whip out, which continued to damage her until she died. So I I actually didn't even have to kill her. She basically killed herself on me like she committed suicide against my whip. It was really weird. She did like the Urukai thing where like you stabbed her and she like pulled herself forward <laughs> yes. onto the whip. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was so bizarre. But I mean, like that's how uninspired the, the boss fights are until you get to the boss rush. So the fourth boss is the, it's like a, it looked kind of like a pterodactyl skeleton, but it's like on its feet and it's got the spear, like a, it's a glaive. Um, that boss is hard. Like it, it moves all over the place jumping flying in it's got a ton of invincibility frames so you have to hit it and then immediately retreat because it will hit you while it has its invincibility frames going it's it's it is unlike every boss that came before it and then the demon thing that's flying around is like sometimes he's out of your range and it's like oh my god out of my range even with the giant whip like and he 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 flies in a pattern that's like not quite on the the northeast southwest trajectory. Mm. So sometimes you can whip under or over him, which and then he hits you and you feel like an idiot. So like that one's super hard. And then death is moves a million miles an hour, and he's got his little scythes that are just flying all over the place. You gotta he can suck you in, and he throws his scythe. So like you have to be running from him and then jump over. It's hard, dude. <laughs> like when you when you get to Dracula there's like the flames flying around and then he makes these like little balls appear and they look exactly like the fireballs. But if you hit them, chicken falls out of them so that you can get health. It's the only boss fight you can. Yes, I'm serious. It's the only boss fight where you can get health during the boss fight, which is like super clutch. But I say all that to say this, you play 95% of the game. And for that 95% of the game, monsters are not a threat. They're a complete cakewalk and you, the ones that can't be beaten in one whip shot take two or three or 10, but you can stand there and just wail on them until they die. And then they just, 
totally like 180 degrees pivot. And they're like, Hey, the whip no longer solves all your problems. You got to duck and weave and bob and move. And suddenly what they've done is they've taken the platforming mechanics that you've been dealing with and they have stuck them into a combat situation in a way that makes sense. Like code wise, like get a super low level programming sense, but you have not been getting trained for it thematically. You have not been thematically conditioned to be in platforming mind and in combat mind at the same time, which they should have been doing. And the original Castlevania got right. Like the original Castlevania got right. It forced you to deal with the clunky jumping and the clunky whipping when every single mistake potentially resulted in death, not because you fell in a pit, but because the boss was nailing you over and over. And I just, I was like shocked like that. That's the summary of my monologue here is like, I was just shocked that they not only screwed this up, but only managed to screw it up for a portion of the game. And then we're like, Oh crap, wait, <laughs> the boss encounters are supposed to be interesting. Yeah. And, and I, and I am wondering like why that is. Cause I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. Like the way I, I handled every single boss fight was to um, just sit there and just, just beat the hell out of them. The, the one, there's one skull boss that drops, um, rocks on you and that one i just realized i just had to wait till it just whip straight up and eventually he'll come over me and then just to beat him to death so agreed 100 percent. and yeah i'm not sure if if the idea was that um you know well we can't make this because it, the original castlevania had like five bosses you know uh five either five or six and then dracula or yeah ar- around there something like that yeah. right but this one has a million bosses, right? So there's a million levels, you know? So I don't know if they thought like, oh man, we can't make every single boss fight that difficult because no one's going to deal with that or something. I'm not sure. But yeah, agreed 100%. I am glad that they eventually said, no, you had your fun. Now, if you want to say that you beat this game, beat the game. But it is, that that does make for one hell of a difficulty spike. Yeah. And and you can tell because there's those continues in between, there's no level leading up to those bosses. It's literally just prove you can beat this boss. Like they were thoughtful about it, but why it's, it's like if you were making a peanut butter sandwich and you just put all of the peanut butter in like one corner of the bread, it's just <laughs> like, well, yeah, but I mean, it's all in there and it's like, spread it out a little. Kind of, but uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's pretty much all I had. Did you have anything else? Uh, no, my, my final just random thought that I wanted to share is, uh, because I love Symphony of the Night so much, going up to fight Dracula is like almost a one-to-one of going up to fight Dracula in Symphony of the Night. It's the same kind of staircase. It's the same little room. It's so the same that when I died like the 50th time trying to beat Dracula, I swung just to like give myself a chuckle. I swung at a part of the wall that I know in symphony of the night has secrets in it. And I was just like, where are my secrets? I need better armor so I can defeat Dracula. <laughs> because, like that's how much of a match it is, which had an interesting psychological effect on me because I was fighting Dracula and in symphony of the night, when you fight him the first time in the beginning of the game, Uh, When you get his health all the way down, he transforms into a gigantic monster and it becomes a total show. So (laughs) I was really struggling and I was like, oh, my God, am I going to get his health all the way down and then I'm going to have to beat him again? And thankfully, the answer is no. He transforms at half health and then you you get him down and then you're done. (laughs) I was like, I wouldn't be feeling all this anxiety if I wasn't thinking of how this fight goes in Symphony of the Night. If you weren't just immediately like externalizing that and saying like, no, but, but clearly there's more, obviously there is because there's, there's more in this other game that I love. Um, so, uh, what do you think, man? So hold up. Yeah. I say no nostalgia goggles required, uh, no nostalgia goggles required. And if like a lot of people, our age, you either are deeply in love with the original Castlevania or you're deeply in love with symphony of the night. And like you either miss this one or you never really gave it a chance. Like it's worth going back for there's a, uh, there's like the Castlevania set anthology, whatever on the switch. So if you don't have original hardware and you don't emulate cause you shouldn't, cause it's wrong. 
um you, like you can still very easily get access to this game legitimately so like i would say this is actually worth going back for even if like me your castlevania is symphony of the night or like you your castlevania is the original castlevania like this is this entry stands on its own and it's a shame it fell between the original Castlevania and Symphony of the Night because the thing it's actually proximate to is Castlevania 3, which sucked, and Castlevania 2, which also <laughs> which also kind of sucked. So like if they made the original Castlevania and then did nothing and then said, "Okay, we're going to remake it for the Super Nintendo," I don't think this game would have been kind of like almost lost to history the way it was. Even with the crazy whip, even with the weird difficulty spikes and stuff, like I, I could recommend this to anybody. Like it's a solid entry in the series. Oh yeah, no, um, I agreed one hundred percent. I no nostalgia goggles required for me. This game's like a neutral good, which is to say that, you know, as far as the mechanics built into it, the way the game is crafted, like it's not, it's not perfect, right? It's not lawful, right? It's not chaotic either, where it's just all <laughs> over the place, right? You know, it's it's just it's it's solid but the game is fun it just is you know um it, it's it's definitely more like potato chips than you know like a very refined meal right you know so if somebody said to me you know hey uh like what's the best game ever made this wouldn't make even the top 50 for best games ever made but if people said what are what's the most fun games you've ever played this one may have a scrapping chance because it's it's just it's fun it's it's a game that you can plug in uh, it's enjoyable to kind of walk through. It's also not exceedingly difficult. So it's one that, you know, if you're looking for a game for your eight-year-old to start kind of getting into playing video games, stuff like that, I mean, and you're okay with some of the the, the darker theming. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, like, like queue up Symphony of the Night, or, I mean, yes, queue up Symphony of the Night. Also, queue up Castlevania IV. Um, because, man, you know, you just plug that thing in and you whip it, you whip it good. The curtain falls the music plays, the credits roll, then it all fades to black. And you're left by yourself, the fanfare is gone. There's no player two there by your side to share victories won. But as you slowly progress down the hall to your bed, a few great events leak back into your head From the time that you spent Traversing the land Battling evil, fighting the darkness Just sword in hand Your memories creep in With the edge of a smile You realize again What you lost for a while you're gonna think back much less On how you saved the day Than on all The experience gained At the end of it all The gamers play what we play Half our game over But rather for what we take Ah, play Long for 